Hi, welcome to part one of module four. In this part, we are focused on how do you use explicit instruction within intensive intervention. And so in this part, you're going to learn how you should include modeling and practice within the delivery of intensive intervention. And you're also going to learn which supporting practices must be included within expl your explicit instruction. So we always start with this question, where are we? Here's where we are in our DBI diagram. We're focused on those orange parts where we're thinking about that instructional platform. And speaking of that instructional platform, remember you're always going to conduct a diagnostic to figure out strengths and weaknesses, develop the scope and sequence, and then identify what's going to go into that instructional platform. And you're always wanting to use evidence-based interventions. And remember, when those aren't available, you want to use evidence-based strategies. So when I'm thinking about that instructional platform, I'm really focused on this part here of the DBI diagram, but then I'm going to use that progress monitoring to understand whether that instructional platform is effective. And if it's not, we'll do an adaptation. Now, explicit instruction is going to fit into this part of our DBI diagram and this part of our DBI diagram. And you'll see that as we work through this part of the module. Now, why should we focus on explicit instruction? Remember we talked about the evidence-based practices related to students with learning difficulties. And the one that I always want to focus on first is, there it is, explicit instruction. Now the others, I'll go ahead and fill them in just in case you are wondering what they are. Uh, so we want to use explicit instruction, multiple representations, and concise language when we're delivering the instruction to students. And then strategies that should be embedded within intensive intervention are fluency building, problem solving, and a motivation component. But that yellow arrow shows us where we are today. We are talking about explicit instruction. It's really foundational to all instruction that you would provide within a DBI framework. So let's go ahead and talk about it now. No, no, wait. Stop for a second. Oh, Sarah, hi, that, Devin. Sarah, that's, that's, not, that's not explicit instruction. No, I'm this sorry, is sorry. explicit instruction. This is the explicit instruction. No, no, no. I, I presented that in the first course, and that is not that is not what. Well, it what does like. explicit instruction look like to you? Well, uh, it's yeah, it looks like that. It has different colors. Wait, but just because it has different colors doesn't mean it's not the same model. I look, just think this yours has my. I just think it looks. I just think looks. I just think it looks better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might look better to you, but with a navy blue background, I think this one looks a little okay, better. Well, but would great. you agree that this model is pretty much the same yeah, that model? model? That, that model is exactly the same. I would oh, say I'm sorry, it's exactly the same for, because for I that. copied it from your presentation <laughs> and then changed the colors. All right, great. Yeah? Does it look okay? It looks wonderful. All right, can we proceed? Yeah, it's great. I'm just going to listen in and see, uh, see how it goes. Oh, see how I do? Do you want to chime in every once in a while? I'm going to try. Out? I'm going to try not to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So we're going to focus on explicit instruction. And the first part I want to focus on here is the modeling. So I'm going to cover up everything else so we don't, we don't see it. So in the modeling, which some of you pro probably interpret as the I do of explicit instruction. Do you think it's the I do of explicit instruction? I do think it's that. <laughs> I do think it's the I, I do. do. <laughs> yes, all right, perfect. Um, here there are two things that you really need to think about. Providing a clear explanation. Now, when I think about clear explanations, you need to state the goal and why it's important. So you might say something like, hey, Devin, today we're learning about division. This is important because sometimes you want to equally share things with your friends. Could you think of a way to state the goal of a lesson and why it's important? <laughs> you might use this example. Okay, here. good. I might say, let's continue. Work, let's continue working with our three-dimensional shapes and volume. I know volume is like everywhere around us, isn't it? Understanding volume and calculating volume helps with measuring capacity. I might oh, say that. That's a that really would be a clear good explanation. Goal. And I also like why you said this was important. That's a question that students often have in mathematics. Did that ever happen in your teaching where students were like, why do we have to learn this? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's why we want to kind of nip that problem in the bud before we get started. So the first thing that we're going to look at is here is our tutor, Suzanne, and she is working with Jerem. And we're going to see how she states the goal and its importance. Hi, Jerem. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Today, we're going to work on some multiplication facts, okay? This is important because when you're working word problems, you'll know what multiplication means and how to solve multiplication. 
Hey there, Devin. As Susie was talking about the goal and why it's important, it was very brief, but it really helps set the stage for what Jerem is going to work on. And when she states the goal, today we're learning multiplication. It's probably starting to dust off some cobwebs in his brain. So maybe he starts thinking about, oh, the multiplication symbol, maybe factors, or maybe products, or maybe, oh, I did multiplication yesterday. So it's a really helpful thing to include there. So in modeling, after you talk about the goal and why it's important, you are going to model the steps of a problem. Let me go ahead and show you an example of this. So actually, do you want to be my student? Sure. Okay. Um, well, your chalkboard is here, so we have to switch places. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. All right, Devin, we're going to solve the problem 26 plus 79. Do you want to go ahead and write that on your chalkboard? Sure. All right. All right, first I have to decide the operation. So do you add, subtract, multiply, or divide? I add. Add, that's right, the plus sign tells you to add. So you're going to add 26 plus 79. Today let's use our partial sum strategy to add these numbers. Okay. So first we're gonna add the 10. So I'm going to add 20 plus 70. What's 20 plus 70? 90. 90, so go ahead and write 90 right there. All right, now you're going to add six plus nine. What's six plus nine? 15. Go ahead and write 15 right here. Now finally, we're gonna add these partial sums. So I wanna go ahead and have you draw the equal line and a plus sign, and let's add these sums. So if I have 90 plus 10, that is? 10, 100. Mm -hmm. And zero plus five is? Five. Five. So when you have 29 plus 79, it equals what? 105. 105. Very nice work. I like how you wrote it to the side there so everyone could see it. So now we're going to go ahead and watch Dariella, and we'll actually erase before we can see her, but she's going to model the steps for solving a word problem. So we'll get this erased and then we'll get our video started. I have three Pokemon balls and you have five Pokemon balls. How many Pokemon balls do we have all together? Let's see these pictures to help us solve the problem. I have three Pokemon balls, one, two, three, and you have five. One, two, three, four, five. Which one of these groups is greater? Yours or mine? Yours, great job. So here we have five Pokemon balls, and here we have three Pokemon balls. Let's count up from five to see how many we have all together, okay? So let's start with five. Five, six, seven, eight. Great job. So we have eight Pokemon balls all together. How many Pokemon balls do we have? Eight. Eight, great job. So three plus five equals eight, eight Pokemon balls. That's great, great adding. Great. All right, so what did you think about that, Devin? Did she do a nice job modeling the steps? I thought so. It yeah. lined up very nicely with yeah, what so you she described. Showed, yeah, she showed the reading of the problem and then the adding of the numbers. Mm -hmm. All right, that consistent. was a really, yeah, it was a very good example. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me like oh. this is in very good hands. So, oh, okay. So uh, I don't need you here to monitor me <laughs> since I have the blue background and the different <laughs> diagram? I mean, the colors are different. The but colors I think the content are different. is fantastic. Yeah. I'm sure you all will agree. So I'm going to leave you to it. There might okay. be a national center emergency. So. <laughs> there is a national center so, emergency. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. <laughs> all, all right. right. Bye, everyone. We will see you. Devin Kern slash Clark Kent. <laughs> all right. Now we're going to look at Stephen do some modeling of the steps with Eric. Uh, it's going to, uh, it's, it's pretty similar in terms of the modeling of steps, but I just wanted to show you what this would look like with an older student. Let's go ahead and check it out. When we have fractions with denominators that are different, we have to take a couple of steps before we can add them, okay? Okay. Alright, so let's look at the steps here that we have to take. So, uh, when we're adding fractions with uh, different denominators, the first thing we do is we're going to model the fractions, and then we're going to find multiples of the denominators. The third thing is we determine the lowest common denominator, Next, we determine how many new sets of each fraction you need and make them. And then the last thing is you add. Okay. All right. All right, so let's look at these two fractions here. What is this first fraction? It's one fourth. Good, and what is the second fraction? Two thirds. Two thirds, good. All right, so what is the first thing we need to do? We need to model the fraction. 
Good, model of fractions. So we're going to use these to model the fractions, okay? So the denominator tells us how many equal parts are in a set. Four. Good, so there are four equal parts in the set. So we're going to put in, put four pieces to model the f four equal parts, all right? Mm -hmm. And then what does the um, numerator tell us? There's one, there's one. There's one, there's one, there's one numerator. So, good, there is, the numerator tells us how many pieces are represented, right? right. So we're representing one out of four. So one fourth, right? One fourth. One fourth, good. So we're going to move this up here. And what's our next fraction? Two thirds. Two thirds. So how many total pieces are there in our set? Three. Three, good. So let's get out three pieces. And how many pieces are represented? There are three pieces represented, and for a numerator, there's two, there's two numerators. So the numerator is two, which tells us there are two parts being represented, right? Right. Good. So there are one, two out of three. So two thirds, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So now, what is the next thing we do? We've modeled the fraction. What do we do next? Find multiples of the denominator. Find multiples of the denominator, good. So let's start with the one-fourth. What is the denominator in one-fourth? Denominator one-fourth is the four. Four, good. So we're gonna write the four right here in our model. And we're going to, so when we find multiples, we can think of it as multiplying, okay? Okay. So we're gonna multiply we're going to find five, the first five multiples of the denominator, so a four, okay? All right, so what is four times one? One. Are you sure? I mean, four. Ah, oh, that's all right. Good. So what is four times two? Eight. Good. What is four times three? Twelve. Twelve, good. What is four times four? Sixteen. Sixteen, good. And four times five? 20. 20, good. And let's do our next denominator. What's the other denominator? Two thirds. So the fraction is two thirds, um, and what's the denominator? That's three. Three, good. So we're gonna write the other denominator right there, and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna find the first five multiples of three, okay? Okay. All right, so what's three times one? Three times one is three. Good. Three times two? Three times two is six. Good. Three times three? Three times three is nine. Nine. And three times four? Three times four is twelve. Good. And three times five? Three times five is six. No, fifteen. Fifteen, good. All right, so we have found the multiples, and what's the next thing we do? We determine the lowest common denominator. Lowest common denominator, good. So we have all these multiples of the two denominators, and we have to find the numbers that are the same, okay? So which number do both of these tests have in common? Uh, they both have in common. They have twos in common. So what's this number? 12. 12, so they both have 12s in common, right? Right. Good, so let's circle those numbers, 12 and 12. All right, so we found the lowest common uh, multiple the lowest common denominator, and so what's what do we do after that? We d we determine how many new sets of each fraction you need to make them. Good. So to do that, we see how many times we have to multiply to get the lowest common denominator. Okay. Okay. All right. So with the four, we multiplied one, two, three times, right? Mm -hmm. So to get the 12, we multiply 4 times 3, right? right? So how many sets of the 1 fourths do we need? 3. 3 sets, good. So we already have one set here. All right, so we're going to come back to it and make those sets in a little bit, okay? Okay. All right, but now let's see how many times we had to, how many sets of the 2 thirds we need, all right? All right. So count with me as we see how many sets we're going to need, all right? So we multiply 1. one. Two, two, three, three four. four. Good. So we multiply three how many times to get 12? We need multiply it four times. Good. So we need how many sets? 
We have four sets. Four sets, good. All right, so let's make those different sets. So with the one fourth, how many sets do we need? 12, I mean three. Three sets, good. So we already have one set. So let's make two more sets. And now, what is So does this one need to be red or yellow? Good, awesome. So we have three sets of the one-fourth. And how many sets of the two-thirds do we need? We need four. Four sets, good job. So we already have one. How many more sets do we need? We need three more. Good. <clears throat> So do we have four sets for two thirds? Yes. Good job. All right, so the circle, the numbers that we circled represent our new denominator, okay? So we need to, in each of these, we need to see if there are 12 total pieces now, all right? So let's count them together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Are there 12 there? Yeah. Good. So let's count and see if we have 12 up here too, all right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So do we have twelve there? Yes. Awesome. Good job. All right. So now, what's the last thing with it we need to do? Combine all the fractions. So we need to combine the fraction sets. All right. So I'm going to make sets of twelve. All right. Using these um, counters, I'm going to make sets of twelve. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the red ones first though, all right? Because that'll tell, tell us what our numerator is, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's count. One, two, two three, three, four, four five, five, six, six seven, seven, eight, eight nine, nine, 10, 10 11. 11, have we gotten to 12 yet? No. No, so what do we need to do? We're gonna get one more, mm -hmm. good. One more, good. All right, so now, how many yellow ones do you think we have left? We have 12 left. 12 left, good. So we can make this a set of its own, but we're not going to really use these because they don't really represent anything, okay? All right, thank you. All right, so we're looking at the red ones to represent our new numerator, okay? Okay. All right, so when we add these, the red ones are going to represent our numerator and how many total there are are going to represent our denominator, okay? All right, so let's count how many red ones there are to uh, figure out our numerator, okay? So let's count. One, two, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 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 So what's our numerator? Our numerator is eleven. Eleven. Good job. And what is our denominator going to be? Um, how many total pieces are there in this line? Twelve. Twelve. Good. So one fourth plus two thirds equals twelve. I mean, equals eleven and twelve. Good job. Awesome. All right, so that was a really good example that Stephen did in terms of modeling steps. Now that example took quite a bit longer, um, but Stephen was working with an eighth grade student. The example before this was Dariella working with a kindergarten student. Often the problems that kindergarten students are going to work on solving don't have that many steps, so it takes a, a briefer amount of time to do that. This problem that Stephen was working on with Eric, addition, addition fractions with unlike denominators, there's quite a few steps and he had to model each and, each and every one of those. And he did a really nice job modeling those steps. Another thing that Stephen did a nice job in terms of his clear explanation was using concise 
language. So he was very concise with talking about denominators and numerators, very concise with talking about addition, you, uh, concise with using uh, the multiples. If we think about our example that I worked on with Devin, he had to run off to a really important call. Um, but when I think about this one, there's uh, quite a bit of concise language in this <clears throat> in this example. And I'm going to kind of move over here so I can circle these a little bit easier. So if I say to solve 26 plus 79, kind of circle it there, I decide about the operation. So that's a concise mathematical term. Do I add? Do I subtract? Do I multiply? Or do I divide? So you can see I'm being um, pretty concise with my language. I'm not adding a lot of flowery language into this, but I'm like, to solve this, I first have to decide about the operation. Do I add, subtract, multiply, or divide? This is all important language that the student needs to focus in on in order to solve this problem. And then I'm going to go ahead and erase this, but as we go, I talk about, oh, I need to add the tens. I need to add the ones. I'm being concise and precise with the mathematical language that I'm using, and we'll talk a lot more in this module. So I want you to go back and uh, just watch the very beginning of this video with Stephen. So we'll just watch about the first 30 seconds. And I want you to pick out the concise language that Stephen uses with Eric. But when we have fractions with denominators that are different, we have to take a couple of steps before we can add them, okay? Okay. All right. So let's look at the steps here that we have to take. So the, when we're adding fractions with uh, different denominators the first thing we do is we're going to model the fractions and then we're going to find multiples of the denominators the all right i'll go ahead and stop right there we don't have to watch the whole video but notice how stephen was uh very specific with the mathematical language that he was using he talked about uh, adding fractions with different denominators. He also could have used the word unlike there. And then when he started to go over the steps, so when we did the modeling, he said first we need to model the fractions, um, and then we need to look at look at the denominators and determine whether they are different. So he's being very uh, meaningful and planned with the language that he's using. Now when we think about our explicit instruction, we've really just been focusing on our modeling. And we've been focusing on this clear explanation there, all right? And so that involves the goal, uh, what they're learning today, why that's important, uh, a modeling of the steps, and when you're do using that, uh, doing that using very concise language. So uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a break here. It's time for you to get out your workbook and look at activity number one. We want you to watch this video of intensive intervention and fill in the table with the different components that you saw of modeling, really focusing on the clear explanation. Hey, I'm popping in looking a little bit different because we had some audio issues with the last time I did this slide, so let's do it again. So we are talking about explicit instruction and talking about the modeling that we provide within explicit instruction. And we just saw some good examples of clear explanations and now I want to briefly talk about planned examples. So when we are teaching something within intensive intervention, we need to be purposeful with the examples that we provide to students. So for example, if I am teaching something about division, I want you to think about whether you're going to provide um, students with division presented this way, this way, or that way. So you've got to be able to think about how do you want to show division and what types of problems you're going to show to your students. Also within the examples that you use within modeling, I want you to think about perhaps using examples combined with non-examples. For example, if you are teaching division, you might use this problem for modeling, this problem for modeling, and this problem for modeling. Why might this problem here be important? Because the single biggest mistake that students make in mathematics is that they um, interpret the operation symbol and do the wrong operation. Uh, so they interpret the operation symbol incorrectly and they do the wrong operation. So if I'm solving problems like this in division and if I get to this problem and if we don't have a good discussion about that this is the minus sign instead of the division symbol, students might answer this as 5 instead of as 20. So it's okay to you include non-examples within the examples that you provide within your explicit instruction. So let's head to workbook activity number two. 
I'd like you to look at each of the intensive intervention topics, and I want you to think about four examples and two non-examples that you might use in your modeling and practice. So let's continue with our model of explicit instruction. We've talked about modeling, which includes a clear explanation and planned examples. And now we're going to focus over here on this side with practice. When we think about practice, which some of you might interpret as the we do and you do, I'm going to use the terms guided practice and independent practice. So let's first talk about this guided practice here. What is guided practice? Well, guided practice is when the teacher and student practice together. So if I was the tutor, that's me doing math, and if you were the student, that's you doing math. We're working on the same problems and we're working on them together. I might have a whiteboard and you might have a whiteboard and we're doing the same problem. Maybe I have a workbook and you have a workbook. There's lots of ways to do this, and in fact, there's one way, and you're going to watch it now. And you get to watch the old me do an example of guided practice here. So I want you to go ahead and check out the guided practice that's um, done within this lesson, and then the, another old me will come back and debrief after this video. You have your map there, and you know what? I'm going to make a map for myself right here, because we can do this one together. So I'm going to have a box and an equal sign and another box right there, okay? So we have our fraction tiles. So what problem are we going to work on this time? 3 plus x equals 6. 3 plus x equals 6. So what is the first thing that we're going to show? Three. three. All right, so I'm going to show three, and I want you to show three. And are we going to put it on the left side of the equal sign or the right side? The left. The left side. All right, so go ahead and get your three out and show, put them, set them up right like that. Mine are hard to see on the bed, mm -hmm. <laughs> on my, my tan desk, but it works out. And then to that, we're adding what? X. X. So which of these manipulatives can we use to represent X? The rods. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and put our rod there. All right, so I've got three plus X. And then on the other side of the equal sign, how many do we have to put up? Six. Six. All right. You want to go ahead and get six, and I'll get my six out here. All right. So I like your double counting there to check. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. I have six. You have six. Now we want to isolate the variable. variable. And what is our variable? Is it the brown cubes or the green rod? The green rod. Green rod, because it represents what? The X. Yeah, so, yeah, so we want to isolate that variable. So how can we do that? What can we do with these units right here to isolate that variable? We create zero pairs. Yeah, we're going to create zero pairs. So how many zero pairs do we need to create? Three. Three. All right, so you want to go ahead and create your three zero pairs, and I'll create my three zero pairs? Okay. All right, we've got that. Now, if you put three zero pairs on the left side of the equal sign, what do you have to do to the other side? You have to make it on the other side. And you have to make it on the other side. And how many zero pairs are we going to make over there? Three. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring out some more. We'll probably need some more of these units. Mm -hmm. Oops, didn't fall there. All right, so we need three. Okay, all right. So let's see. My work looks like your work. All right, well, it looks good. Now we need to isolate that variable. So what are we going to do with our zero pairs? We move them away. We'll move them in a way because we're going to kind of take them off of our workspace. So let's go ahead and move those three zero pairs away. And then how many zero pairs can we move away over here? Three. Three. So go ahead and do that too. Okay. So when I have 3x plus 6, x equals what? Three. Three. Do you want to go ahead and fill that in there and make sure that that checks out? Okay, and if you told me x equals 3, so I could just go ahead and write a 3 in there. And now you tell me, does that check out? 3 plus 3 equals 6. Yeah, so did we solve the equation correctly? Awesome, good job for us. Now the next part of the practice is doing independent practice. And this is where the student practices with teacher support. So now we're going to watch Natalia solve this problem. Now notice I didn't say, now it's your turn, go for it, you're on your own. She's going to be solving the problem, but I'm still going to be there helping her out. Go ahead and check it out. Two. All right, read that for me. Seven equals x plus two. Now before we had x on the left side of the equal sign. Now where is it? On the Right. On the right side. So does it matter if x is on the left side or the right side? No. I can still set up and solve for x, okay? So talk me through what you're going to do here. We're going to use a green rod to um, place x. All right, go ahead and place it on there. Okay. All right. And then we're going to use two units to dignify two. 
represent. Great. All right. And then what do you need on the left side of the equal sign? Seven. seven. And why are you putting seven over there? Seven. Yeah, kind of, problem kind of tells us to do that, right? All right. So read read this equation here. Seven equals x plus two. And then what have you shown with your math tools? I've shown seven units over here mm -hmm. with the equal sign, and then two, one rod to represent x with two. Okay. So if you are reading that, would it be seven equals x plus two? Yes. Awesome. All right. Now I want you to isolate the variable. variable. All right, isolate this variable. How are you going to do that? I take I take the negatives and try to take these away. Okay, and why do those negatives work out with us? What do we call those? Zero pairs. Very good. All right, so go ahead and create your zero pairs. Nice. Okay, and if you put zero pairs on one side of the equal sign, what do you have to do to the other side? Put zero pairs on the other mm -hmm. side. Great. Okay, so now you're going to cancel your zero pairs. So how, how what is that going to look like? We move them away. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you've solved for x now, so x equals what? x equals 5 equals x. 5 equals x, or mm -hmm. x equals 5. Can we say it both ways? Yes. Yeah, that's the cool thing about algebra. Do you want to go ahead and put in... 5 for x to make sure we solve this equation correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Besides your excitement with throwing the marker. <laughs> so if we have 7 on this side of the equal sign. How many do we have on that side of the equal sign? 7. Yeah, so yeah. 7 equals 7. Does that work out? Yes. Yeah, all right, so I liked how you solved for x equals five. Very nice work today with your algebra titles. Great job. All right, so that was an example of independent practice. There, I wasn't doing the math. I didn't have my algebra tiles out. I wasn't doing them. Natalia was doing almost all of the work. Now, I was there still supporting her, but she was really starting to do these problems on her own. Now I want you to think about this with workbook activity number three. You're going to continue watching a video of intensive intervention. And now you're going to fill in the table with different components of practice. Earlier we did this with modeling. Now it's your turn to do this with practice. What is the guided practice and what is the independent practice? All right, so we've been focusing on explicit instruction. First, we talked about modeling using clear explanations and planned examples. Then we talked about practice using guided practice and independent practice. Now it's time to focus on this area here. And before I, uh, I cover up the other things, I want to talk about why this supporting practice is across modeling and practice. When you are modeling, and when you are engaging the students in practice, these supporting practices must be in play. So you need to be asking the right questions, eliciting frequent responses, providing immediate specific feedback, and maintaining a brisk pace. You do that in modeling and you do that in practice. Now what do I often see? I often see teachers do a lot of this within practice as they're, they're getting the students to, to work with them. Sometimes when teachers are doing modeling, teachers think, oh, it's the teacher show. I'm just doing all this teacher talk. But even when you are modeling, you need to be asking questions, getting students to respond frequently, providing feedback when students answer correctly or incorrectly, and you really need to keep that lesson maintaining at a brisk pace. So that's why you see supporting practices listed under modeling and you see supporting practices listed under practice. So now let's do focus on those, uh, those supporting practices. And first we're gonna focus on asking the right questions. Asking the right questions in mathematics means you are asking a combination of low level and high level questions. So here are some examples of low level questions. You might ask, what's 10 times nine? Which of these shapes has six sides? What do you do when you see a word problem? Those are low level questions because they don't really require a lot of thought from the, from the student. Um, although some problems like seven times nine might be quite challenging. Usually low level questions have what, which uh, beginnings to them. 
You also need to be asking a combination of high level questions. So why do we have to regroup? What does it mean to regroup? How would you solve this problem? Why do you have to use zero pairs? That would be a question that I could have asked in the last example where I was teaching. This asking the right questions gets students to participate and engage in the mathematics learning. Now the next supporting practice that we have to think about is eliciting frequent responses. And responses need to be a mix of different ways for students to respond. So you might ask for a class-wide response. Maybe you'd ask for an individual response. Maybe students are going to talk with a partner or chat in a small group. Maybe students will do something they'll write on paper. Maybe they'll write on their whiteboard. Maybe they'll give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. There's lots of ways that students can respond. Now the idea here is that students respond frequently. And you might say, well, Sarah, what does frequently mean? Well, my rule of thumb is that students always respond every 30 to 60 seconds in some way. Now, if they're responding more frequently than that, that's great but you should have students respond every 30 to 60 seconds to really make sure that you're checking in and that they're engaged in the lesson. When students are responding frequently, they're on task. They don't have an opportunity to get off task. They're paying attention. If students aren't frequently responding, they start looking around and start doing stuff, start messing around in their desk, you know what students do, and then they're not paying attention, and therefore mathematics learning is not going on. So here are some examples of ways that you can have uh, students respond in mathematics. Oh, I finished, I finished them there. Um, they can turn and discuss, they can write, they can draw, they can get out their math journal. There are so many ways to get students to respond. And I really encourage you to change up the ways that students respond. I see some teachers have students do something with a partner and then they answer individually and then they give a class-wide choral response. That's awesome. Some teachers just keep asking students to raise their hand and that's okay, would it, but it would be better if you had students frequently respond and also respond in different ways. Now our third practice that we're going to talk about in terms of the supporting practices is providing immediate specific feedback and this should be both affirmative and corrective. Now when you're providing affirmative feedback you can say good job, great, give a high five, that type of thing. But you can also be specific with the feedback that you're providing to students. So I might say good, good job using your word problem attack strategy. So it shows students why I think they're doing a good job. Now when I'm thinking about corrective feedback, I always say let's look at that again and then ask the student to try to tell me like what were you thinking here? So if the student made a mistake when they were adding numbers in the hundreds column, I'd say let's look at that again. Tell me how you added in the hundreds column to get uh, students to correct their work before going on and making more math mistakes. One of the things in math is that it takes a lot longer to unlearn something that you learned incorrectly than to learn it correctly. So when students make mistakes, you have to say, let's look at that again. Let's try that again. Tell me what you were thinking here. You have to intervene at the time the mistake is made so that students learn from that mistake and can move on. And then our last supporting practice is maintaining a brisk pace. And here, I always think of having your lessons to be planned and organized. So if you are using manipulatives, they're in baggies, they're all ready to go. If you are gonna have students write on whiteboards, those whiteboards are out, they have markers out that work, and the erasers are nearby. If you're gonna have students use their textbook or their workbook, those are out and they're ready to go. So be planned and be organized. Don't waste students' time. Let's look at workbook activity number four. You're gonna rewatch that video of intensive intervention and I want you to identify the supporting practices. So how, what questions are asked? What right questions are asked? How do students respond? How does the teacher provide immediate feedback? And what is the brisk pace of the lesson? Okay, so we've been talking about explicit instruction. And didn't like my colors. I changed them to match my beautiful blue background. But we were talking about this green section here where the modeling is going on. We talked about this blue section here where practice is um, going on. The students are engaged in practice. And then we talked about these supporting practices that are always going on in both modeling and practice. Now in this diagram, modeling and practice are weighted 50-50. It just looks really nice that way. 
But you know, if you're introducing new material, you might have a lot of modeling, a little bit of practice, and those supporting practices are always around. So it's okay that it's not 50-50. Here it's a little bit more 80-20. Now, if you were reviewing material, we might have a little bit of modeling, a lot more practice, and those supporting practices are always going on. So even though my diagram looks like this, you really need to fine tune the explicit instruction depending upon the material that you're introducing or reviewing, and also depending upon your student's needs. Data-based individualization is all about the individual student. Some students might need more modeling and less practice opportunities. Other students might need more, less modeling and more practice opportunities. So where does this fit in our DBI diagram? Remember, I always like to think about our instructional platform, and that's our jumping off point. We, in that, in that instructional platform, we use an evidence-based intervention or a collection of evidence-based strategies. And once we select those, then we have to use explicit instruction to teach those evidence-based practices. So we cannot do anything in the DBI framework, or at least anything in these orange areas, without explicit instruction. It's the cornerstone of everything that we're going to do. So our checklist for part one involves the following. I need you to be steps using concise language. I need you to be providing guided practice opportunities to students. You also need to be providing independent practice opportunities to students. And while you're doing that modeling and practice, you need to be asking the right questions, getting students to respond frequently, providing feedback when necessary, and you need to be planned and organized.